Good morning. If I could please have your attention as you make your way to your seats. Uh, my name is John Bertka, and I'm the Executive Director of the American Conservative. I'd like to welcome you to today's conference entitled American Allies and Interests, Assessing President Trump's Foreign Policy Midterm. Before we get started, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Senator Rand Paul's office for sponsoring today's event uh, in the Senate, as well as to our generous financial supporters, the Charles Koch Institute and Richard and Deborah Young, among many others. Thank you. The mission of the American conservative is to promote a Main Street conservatism that opposes unchecked power and government and business, promotes the flourishing of families and communities through vibrant markets and free people, and embraces realism and restraint in foreign affairs based on America's vital national interests. We accomplish this mission through our print and web publication, which you can find at theamericanconservative.com, through our internship program for aspiring journalists, by informing policymakers on the Hill, as well as through conferences, lectures, and events like you're attending today. The American Conservative was founded in 2002 to reignite the conversation about ideas that had largely been ignored by elites of both parties since the end of the Cold War, chief among them being the vigorous defense of civil liberties, the protection of our national sovereignty, taking a strong stand against crony capitalism, and promoting a foreign policy that serves our vital national interests by securing the safety and happiness of the American people which is the subject of today's conference. If you'd like to follow the conference on social media, our Twitter hashtag is uh, capital T-A-C underscore C-O-N. That's hashtag TAC underscore con. Without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our editor, uh, Jim Antle, uh, to frame today's conversation and talk a little bit about what you can expect to hear from our panelists and speakers. W. James Antle III comes to TAC after managing a stable of reporters as politics editor at the Washington Examiner. A former senior writer at TAC, Antle has also previously served as managing editor of the Daily Caller, editor of the Daily Caller News Foundation, associate editor of the American Spectator. He is the author of Devouring Freedom, Can Big Government Ever Be Stopped? Antle has appeared on Fox News, CNN, MSNBC and NPR, among other outlets, and has written for a wide array of publications, including The Wall Street Journal, Politico, The Week, The LA Times, The Boston Globe, The Daily Beast, The Guardian, Reason, and The Spectator of London. He also serves as a senior advisor to defense priorities. Please join me in welcoming Jim Antle to the podium. Thanks, Johnny. Good morning. Thank you all for being here today on this uh, snowy Thursday morning to talk about some of the most important issues that face our country and really face the world. Uh, we've had two consecutive presidents now of each party who on some level questioned our post 9-11 foreign policy and reached some conclusions that maybe it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, President Trump speaking at CPAC of all places, the Conservative Political Action Conference, said that the Middle East would be better off if over the past 15 years, presidents of both parties had just gone to the beach for a vacation rather than in conducted the policies that they implemented in that region. However, we've seen that the presidential wars are still ongoing and that many of the military interventions that have been launched after 9-11 are still ongoing, and that there really hasn't been quite the noticeable shift in foreign policy that the rhetoric and the campaign promises and the commitments of Barack Obama and Donald Trump would seem to imply. So what does that mean for our prospects for changing foreign policy? What does that mean about our approach to terrorism and protecting our national security and our alliances and our dealings with the world. What does it mean for all of that going forward? What does it mean for Congress? Will they ever seek to regain or assert their constitutional powers and indeed their constitutional duty 
to oversee the, our war and peace? Will they, will they rein in the executive branch in this area as the Constitution requires of them? So we're going to have a number of speakers today, including voices from the pro-peace progressives, from some leading constitutional conservatives, and some people in between, and people whose ideological commitments are, are not so easily described, who are gonna tackle some of these questions and hopefully come up with some answers. So um, I think Bruce Fine is, is, is gonna lead us in, in the next discussion. I'd like to welcome our uh, panelists up for our first panel entitled Taking Back Congressional War Powers, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and the AUMF. Uh, Congressman, Congressman Ken Buck is a Republican from Windsor representing Colorado's fourth congressional district. He was first elected to Congress on November 4th, 2014, and is currently serving his second term in the U.S. House of Representatives. Previously, Representative Buck was elected Weld County District Attorney three times, served as Chief of the Criminal Division for Colorado's U.S. Attorney's Office, and a prosecutor with the U.S. Department of Justice. Representative Buck serves on the House Judiciary Committee and the House Committee on Rules, and also on the Judiciary Subcommittees on Immigration, Border Security, Regulatory Reform, Commercial, and Antitrust Law. He is the author of Drain the Swamp, how Washington corruption is worse than you think. Representative Ro Khanna represents California's 17th Congressional District, located in the heart of Silicon Valley, and is serving his first term. Representative Khanna sits on the House Budget and Armed Services Committee and is a vice chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Prior to serving in Congress, Representative Khanna taught economics at Stanford University, law at Santa Clara University, and American jurisprudence at San Francisco State University. He also worked in the Obama administration as Deputy, Ass Deputy Assistant Secretary at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Representative Khanna wrote the book, Entrepreneurial Nation, Why Manufacturing is Still Key to America's Future, and worked as a, loyal, as a lawyer specializing in intellectual property law. And our moderator, Bruce Fine, was Associate Deputy Attorney General and general counsel of the Federal Communications Commission under President Ronald Reagan, and counselor to the Joint Congressional Committee on Covert Arms Sales to Iran. He's a partner at the law firm of Fine and DeVal, PLLC. Please join me in welcoming our first panel. Well, thank you for coming. It's a very important conference, perhaps. Uh, the most uh, important conference that citizens hold because the power of war and peace is the most important power that the United States government or any government exercises. Now, as uh, some background with regard to how faithful we are uh, to our constitutional dispensation when it comes to war and peace before we begin uh, to hear from our uh, members of Congress. Uh, we are as distant uh, in following the Constitution as the geocentric theory of the universe is to the heliocentric theory. Uh, just some specific facts. One, every member of the Constitutional Convention, every member of state ratification conventions, uh, every uh, participant in the debate on the Constitution agreed that only Congress could take the nation from a state of peace to war. Uh, largely because all history showed the executive branch had a conflict of interest War brings them power, brings them secrecy, uh, brings them kudos, patriotism, uh, and therefore we could never trust the executive branch with a decision uh, basically to legalize first degree murder, which is what war is. Wartime, you can kill people even though they're not threatening you or another. Uh, but so that's clear understanding. Even the most ardent proponent of a muscular executive, Alexander Hamilton said, the plain meaning of the Declare War Clause is only Congress decides whether to go to war. Plain. It wasn't difficult. It wasn't ambiguous. It was as clear as 35 years old as a standard for eligibility to the president. Now, uh, the, the founders were very prescient. In 228 years, Congress has never once 
not once, voted to take the nation from a state of peace to war. In five conflicts, Congress voted to acknowledge we were at a state of war because other countries had committed aggression, whether it's Great Britain in the War of 1812, Mexico in the Mexican-American War, Spain in the Spanish-American War, Germany's unrestricted submarine warfare, and, and Pearl Harbor. But never once has Congress ever voted to initiate war. Uh, on the other hand, presidents have gone to war repeatedly. Congress has not exercised any uh, semblance of war power, at least since the Korean War, 1950. Indeed, we still have an executive branch who insists that Korea was not a war, even though it involved over 5 million US soldiers, 3 million Chinese, millions of Koreans, hundreds of thousands of deaths, and the threat of nuclear war and that the executive branch maintains and Congress acquiesces, no. That wasn't war, Congress didn't authorize any of that. Um, further, treaties uh, uh, contrary to orthodoxy cannot commit the United States to war. No, Article 5 of NATO does not require us to go to war if a NATO member is attacked, whether it's Montenegro or anyone else. It is incredible that that myth persists. Dean Acheson, who's Secretary of State in 1949 before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, when the NATO treaty is before the Senate, said, no, if a NATO member is attacked, we're not automatically at war, only Congress can declare war. Yeah, but we could still live with the, the myth otherwise. And at present, you know, where are we? It would be one thing to excuse constitutional infidelity if it brought great bonanzas in foreign affairs. You know, we're in 172 countries with special forces, nine unconstitutional wars, and our experts in the administration say, we're more threatened today after spending $10 trillion since 9-11 than we were on 9-11. Uh, anyway, that's background to why this is essential to rectify something that's clearly out of control legally and as a matter of policy. But Ro Khanna, why don't you explain uh, how you've sought to utilize the War Powers Resolution at least to bring to a conclusion uh, some of these wars. Well, thank you. That was a terrific presentation. I'd vote for you for anything. You're, uh, I, I agree with... Uh every word of, of your presentation. Uh, and I uh, appreciate being here with Congressman Buck and appreciate Congressman Buck's independence and thinking on uh, so many of these issues. You know, if you look at our, our, our founders, uh, and uh, not just George Washington, but after that, John Quincy Adams, uh, I think every member of Congress should read John Quincy Adams' thoughts on foreign policy. And John Quincy Adams, I mean, there's the famous uh, a passage of not going out uh, to have monsters to destroy. But before that, Quincy Adams says, look, Americans are uh, a nation of values, and there's no uh, harm in having uh, our prayers and our thoughts and our, uh, our blessings with people who seek freedom around the world. Uh, we should cheer them. We should root for them. We just shouldn't militarily intervene. And the reason he says that is uh, liber forces of liberty will become dictatorial forces because we may not know the envy and the ambition and the motives in these conflicts. And we may think we are liberators, but we will be perceived uh, as not uh, being liberators. And that was, uh, there was so much wisdom in, uh, in that perspective of foreign policy, which said uh, we need to be strong uh, in defending uh, our nation, uh, but we shouldn't be intervening uh, around the world. And I think it was one, it's one of the reasons that the United States has had such success. The, I don't think our founders or Madison would have imagined that Congress would abdicate to the extent we have our uh, influence on foreign policy. I mean, the concern, if you read the Federalist Papers that Madison had, is how are we going to stop Congress from having too much power? That was the, the, the concern that they were uh, grappling with. They never thought that Congress would actually give up the power over war and peace. And really, really that is what we've had, had happened, particularly in these last 15 years. I mean, we've had one blunder after another, a blunder in Iraq, blunder in uh, Syria by calling for regime change, blunder in what happened in Ukraine in Georgia, in my view, over trying to overextend NATO, blunder in, uh, in Libya. And these have been bipartisan blunders. And here's the thing, every president has 
runs, every candidate runs saying we're going to get out of these foreign interventions. And the American people seem to like that message. And then they get to the presidency, Democrat or Republican, and they don't make the changes that they promised when they campaigned. Let me address Yemen very briefly, and then uh, would love to hear Congressman Buck's perspective. I don't think there is a significant support, or there is significant support for America being involved in the war in Yemen in any congressional district in this country. I mean, if you went and you held town halls and you said, America needs to be involved in deciding whether the Houthis or the Saudis should be ruling and governing in Yemen. First of all, most people say, where is Yemen? What is Yemen? Why does this matter to us? Right? And then if you were to say further, well, there are hundreds of thousands of children who are dying in Yemen, and the international press, every article starts with the U.S.-backed coalition campaign. Do you want us to be affiliated with that? They say, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Now, maybe some people would say, if there's terrorists in uh, different parts of the world, Al-Qaeda or others, we need to be on the offensive against terrorism. And that's a debate that we can have. But no one would say that we ought to be engaged in a civil war in determining who governs a country, particularly when the bombing in one of these ports in Hodeida is depriving hundreds of thousands of children of food and medicine. And we had yesterday, I, we brought up the War Powers Resolution, the Congressman Buck co-sponsored it, and the idea is that after 15 days, if you bring up a War Powers Resolution, you get a vote. Now, the leadership of the said, you know what they did? They put that deprivileging of that resolution in with a resolution about wolves. I mean, our, our founders would be rolling over in their graves if this was at what was going on. So we don't even have a debate about whether we should be supporting the bombing in Yemen. No debate. No vote. And it's, it, I don't understand. There's no partisanship to this issue. I mean, why should it, why should, if you're a Republican, do you really have a view on whether the Saudis or, uh, or, 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 or the Houthis should be in Yemen? Or do you really want bombing of ports and not having food and medicine? It really shouldn't be a partisan issue. And certainly we should have the pride as members of Congress to say it's our decision whether we should be doing this or not, not the administration's decision. Final thoughts. I mean, the, so, what, so what is motivating? Is, you know, people are not... I don't think it's too simplistic to say, oh, it's the Saudi lobby or, uh, or just uh, a lobbying influence, because most members of Congress, despite uh, uh, concerns of money and all of that, a lot of members of Congress come to things really thinking, uh, I want to do what's right for the nation. I genuinely believe that. So what is motivating people to want to be involved in, in Yemen? There's this view that Iran uh, is a growing threat in the region, and that we need to balance Iran's uh, emergence as a regional power. I mean, that is really, if you talk to people, that's what, what they would say. Well, how has that kind of thinking worked out for the United States? It's what led us to support Saddam Hussein. It's what's led us into the support of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. It has not, that kind of thinking has not made the United States safer. Let me tell you who is not engaged in that kind of thinking. China. There's one place I agree with this president. There's one long-term threat to America's competitiveness, and that's China. Everything else is pretty irrelevant. And you know how we should be dealing with China? We should be investing in our human capital to be innovators and to make sure that we're leading the 21st century in technology. I don't see China getting involved in all these wars. They're not putting their money in getting in, in, involved in, in, in the Middle East. They're putting their money in artificial intelligence and turning out engineering graduates and thinking about the currency that's going to win the 21st century. So my view is the, it's in our national strategic interest 
to have less interventions, that far more of a threat to the United States leadership in the 21st century, far more of a threat than Iran's regional influence in the Middle East, is China's growing economy. And what we ought to be doing is look, not taking our eyes off the ball of what really our challenge is, having more restraint in our interventionism and investing more uh, in development of our human potential and human capital here at home. I could just make an observation about the Iranian threat. How did Iran become the regional hegemon? We invaded Iraq in 2003 and overthrew the biggest obstacle to Iranian expansion. So we create the own problem and then we kind of destroy the sources of apprentice show you how the military then creates its own need to expand. But Ken, why don't you make your observation from the Republican side? But my observations are slightly uh, uh, different, and in, in, uh, I'm looking, uh, Bruce uh, and I actually uh, spent time together in 1986 and 1987 working on the Iran-Contra investigation. And uh, Bruce, I have to tell you something, I don't have a single staffer that uh, was born when you and I were working on that investigation. <laughs> and it goes to what I think is the, the, the central problem in the relationship between the executive branch and, and the legislative branch, and that is the, the legislative branch is underfunded. The uh, uh, legislative branch uh, does not do its job of oversight, and the legislative branch does not, uh, uh, it is inherently risk averse, and the, issues that we're talking about are issues that would require tough political votes and positions that would make members of Congress vulnerable. And so um, as a risk-averse uh, body, we avoid the tough decisions. And uh, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about foreign policy or, or domestic policy, uh, Congress is not doing its job. And, and the result is that the executive branch has uh, the, the flexibility, the, the power to engage in activities without any check or balance, um, and, and it's not what our founders envisioned. And the result is that we have this uh, expansion of our military, whether it is uh, intelligence sharing, whether it is refueling uh, uh, efforts, whether it is uh, training military on the ground. We have. Uh, engaged uh, across the world with uh, regimes that are, uh, frankly, uh, don't share our values, um, and uh, we have not had the kind of vigorous debate that we should have uh, before we get involved. And uh, I think that uh, whether, it, whether you approach it from a conservative's view of what the Constitution intended or um, a uh, a, a broader view of, of what is good for um, uh, the American people and, and uh, the people across the world, I think it is the, the result is, is very similar. And, that, and that's why I think you find progressives and conservatives working together uh, to assert Article I power in, in an area uh, like Yemen, uh, but, but really should go far beyond that. Uh, the, 2001 AUMF is, is being used now in a way that it was never intended and will be used for decades if Congress doesn't act and, and restrict that. And I think, uh, I'm hoping that in the next Congress, um, a, a bipartisan, bicameral effort will be made to uh, rein in that. Now, we would probably disagree about what the extent of a future AUMF is but we both agree that we need to have that discussion and we need to make sure that we are uh, uh, drafting, uh, creating something that is very clear and has boundaries and, and, and then has consequences. That's the other thing that Congress doesn't do very well. Um, I can uh, write a letter to the Department of Transportation about a very serious issue in, in my district and never get a response. And, and no one thinks twice about uh, that. Uh, and it's not like I write a letter, or my staff actually writes a letter every day. We may send three or four letters to the executive branch and not receive a single response on any of them. And it is just the uh, executive branch thumbing its nose at Congress because Congress doesn't exercise uh, its authority. Yeah. Um, during the Vietnam War, the Congress did use the appropriations power 
to prevent expansion of the war into Cambodia or Laos and then ultimately shut the war down. Uh, what are the prospects for Congress resorting to the power of the purse to curtail or end our involvement in at least nine uh, ongoing conflicts? Well, yeah. Bruce, we have an even more uh, uh, recent uh, um, example, and that's the Boland Amendment that, that you and I were involved in, uh, which was really the core, the, the heart of the Iran-Contra investigation. Um, uh, but uh, I think it is, when you're talking about trillion dollar deficits, um, which is the, the current state of affairs right now, um, I don't think you're going to see Congress uh, uh, flex its muscle about any one particular issue. The reason we have deficits is because we refuse to make a choice between A and B. We just fund A and B. And so if it takes 218 votes to pass an appropriations bill and you need the hawks from the Republican Party, uh, uh, then you will uh, plus up the military uh, budget, um, both intelligence and, and defense. Uh, if you, uh, on the other side, if you need uh, the progressives, you're going to plus up um, health care or, or other issues. And so uh, trying to put a coalition together to get to 218 in the House is, uh, is uh, the reason why we are, uh, uh, one, having uh, deficit problems, and two, not conducting oversight the way we should. Uh, Representative Connor, do you think a Democrat House uh, with uh, Democrats running the Appropriations Committee and Rules Committee could attach a rider that said, for example, no monies of the United States shall be expended to conduct hostilities in Yemen or Libya? Is that a possibility? I would support that, uh, but I think it's a challenge. I mean, the, the political challenge is if you uh, articulate a view that uh, cuts off funding, uh, then you're accused of being soft on defense, or you're accused of being soft on national security, or you're accused of not supporting our troops. Now, I was actually very sympathetic when Secretary Mattis came to the Armed Services Committee, and he said the reason we need all this money is because you're asking us to fight all these wars. I mean, I don't believe we need to be increasing the defense budget to the, way, the degree we have, but I don't blame our military. I, believe our, I blame our political leadership. You said nine conflicts. The president has a report twice a year to the Congress. And in that report, he details where we have combat troops, 17 places in this country, in the world, we have combat troops. When there was that whole crisis on Nigeria and you had some members of Congress and senators going out and saying, oh, I didn't have, we know we had troops in Nigeria. Well, every, two, every year, twice a year, you have a report that the president actually details this. 17 places we have combat troops. I've said what we ought to do is have Secretary Mattis and Secretary Pompeo come before the United States House Armed Services Committee or Foreign Affairs Committee, and let's go one by one. Where do we have troops? Why are we there? How much is this costing us? And what's the strategic interest? And at least have that debate. And then, if we, as members of Congress in the political class, give them less of a mission in terms of asking them to do less, then we can talk about cutting the, the budget. But we can't ask them to go fight in 17 places and then not expect them to come and ask for, for funding. So uh, I support what you're saying, but the political challenge is uh, to get people to, to agree to that without seeming that they're opposed to the troops. Mm -hmm. I, I think the point is we didn't ask them to go fight in 17 places. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they interpret the AUMF <laughs> that way. That's why we need a new... UAUMF. And I think they misinterpret the AUMF uh, yeah. that way. I think it's clear that uh, they are doing what they want and we are not trying to rein them in. Well, what do you think explains the political dynamic differently today than in Vietnam when the same argument could have been made, you're cutting off funding for troops that can't go into Cambodia, can't go into Laos, ultimately we cut off the funding even all throughout into China. But the same argument, well, you're not patriotic, could have been made at that time, but it didn't succeed. What do you view today as different than Vietnam that makes it so much less viable to use the power of the purse to cut off some of these wars? In my perspective, and I like Congressman Bucks, I think it's 9-11. I think 9-11 understandably and fundamentally shook this nation. We were hit, and it was a, something that uh, 
traumatized our nation. We, since Pearl Harbor, we have never had that kind of attack on the American homeland. And my sense is that what happens with these candidates, they run for president and they understand that most Americans don't want us in interventions, but they get to the, the Oval Office and they probably have people, military leaders, whisper in their ear saying, you don't want to be the president who rolled something back and then God forbid there's an attack on the homeland and you're going to get blamed. And so, <clears throat> and I have people in my town hall, sometimes they stand up and say, we need to be on the offense against terrorists and not on the defense. And so the challenge is, how do you articulate that restraint in foreign policy in not getting into these interventions doesn't mean that we're not uh, defending against terrorism. And to your point, terrorism has actually spread around the world. But I do think that that's the difference in Vietnam, where Vietnam, uh, I don't think there was this uh, existential fear in the United States about the attack on terrorism. I do think there is a, a fear uh, among citizens. And I think uh, when Bruce and I uh, were much younger, we watched TV and uh, Walter Cronkite told us what the news was. Uh, today, uh, I, I would guess that um, if people in this room listed their primary source of, of uh, information, we would probably have 30 or 40 different sources listed. And we can't even agree in this country on what the truth is, much less what a, uh, what a uh, uh, well thought through policy is. Um, I think that the pressure during the Vietnam War um, uh, was intense on Congress to act. I don't think there is intense public pressure at this point because there is general disagreement on uh, what the facts are on the ground. Um, I have a, a son who is a captain in the Army, um, and I think I get uh, fairly unvarnished. Uh, and actually, one of the things I think that is absolutely uh, amazing about this country is the ability of generals, uh, general officers, to uh, talk to members of Congress um, uh, in, uh, in ways that are completely contrary to the administration's policy. And I think that is uh, a, a huge benefit uh, to me, is to get uh, the, the truth from uh, people who are on the ground. But I don't think we have the public pressure right now that uh, requires members of Congress to act. And so without that pressure, we don't act. Do you think it'd be different if there was a draft? Because there was a draft that maybe prompted many of the parents during the Vietnam era to complain. I think not only parents, but college campuses uh, were on fire uh, during Vietnam as a result of the draft. And I think that's a, a large part of it. So what we've done is we've spent a lot more money um, on an all-volunteer army. And uh, we, we don't feel the effects. A Admiral Mullen testified um, in, on this side of the hill not too long ago uh, about the, the greatest threat to this country is our debt. And uh, I think that that's accurate and we continue to pile on more debt. And, and again, we don't make the decision of what, what, which of the 17 uh, countries we should be fighting in or, or have combat troops in. We, we just do it all and, and that's a, a huge issue. But I think the draft is an important point. Before I open up, I want to ask one last question and see whether it has any traction with regard to overcoming the risk-averse nature of Congress and not getting uh, pressure from your constituents to take votes on this. What about um, using a judicial angle that is authorizing a committee or, like Boehner did, authorizing the House, especially if it's under Democrats, to bring a lawsuit, a declaratory judgment, saying these wars are unconstitutional. If we haven't declared them, the president can't fight on his own. So you would put the burden on the judiciary. Is that something that could possibly be more attractive because it labels you to escape the vote yourself? Well, you're a uh, practicing lawyer, so you may know more about this, but my uh, sense is that these are political questions and the way the judiciary uh, resolves them is if there's silence from one branch and uh, assertion from the other branch, uh, then they will defer uh, to the branch that's uh, taking action. And the challenge has been uh, that the reason these things aren't coming to a head in the judiciary is that Congress has been silent. It's not like we're uh, triggering a constitutional crisis. I mean, it'd be one thing if Congress passed a, uh, a war powers resolution saying don't take action in, in Yemen, and then Mattis and others say no, uh, we're not bound by this because we're actually not engaged in hostilities, and then the judiciary needs to decide it. 
But what is the pattern has been that Congress uh, punts, uh, the executive uh, takes action, and the judiciary says, okay, in two, if there's a conflict in two branches and one is taking action and the other is silent, we're going to de defer to the executive. So my sense is that Congress is going to have to step up and uh, assert its voice if they want uh, recognition with the judiciary. Yeah, I think we have the tools to act if we wanted to act, and, and uh, I don't think that Congress will initiate anything in the courts because we don't initiate anything with our power of the purse or, or other powers that we have. And so uh, I think that the, the answer um, is to uh, get a majority uh, in the House, and, and of course, most of the folks on this side of the Hill uh, take naps during the day, so I don't know that they get a whole lot done anyway. <laughs> All right, audience, questions? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Hi, my name is Mohammed El Ahmed, um, correspondent for Al Jazeera. Uh, my first question is um, Saudi Arabia and the U.S. government. Um, announced recently that the U.S. jet fighters no longer air fuel in the coalition fighters um, bombarding Yemen. Do you think that this step is enough? And what should uh, be done also in order to end the um, U.S. support for the war on Yemen? And my second question, um, what effect does um, Khashoggi killing have on the war on Yemen, and do you think that it um, will um, have a, a, like a, a effect on the um, House um, efforts um, in terms of um, ending the, uh, the the U.S. support on the for, for the coalition there? Either one or both. <laughs> well, basically, I asking what's the assessment of. Uh, the impact uh, on Congress of the ending of the refueling and the assassination of Khashoggi. First of all, it's uh, striking that it took the brutal assass assassination of Khashoggi to focus the world's attention on the crisis in Yemen. It shows uh, our own biases, that when uh, a journalist who was very respected in a political class was murdered, uh, we finally paid attention. But when thousands of Yemeni's kids or women and children were dying, uh, there was indifference because we didn't know them, we didn't read them, their work. And Khashoggi was murdered precisely because he was speaking out about Yemen. I mean, that's why he was murdered. And I'm all for making sure that there's justice, but the real thing that I imagine uh, Khashoggi would want is for us to stop the war in Yemen. Now, yesterday in the debate, and I won't mention the name, of, uh, there was a congressperson who said, well, why, why can't the Democrats just bring the resolution in January? Why do we have to do it now to stop this war? Do you realize that every 10 minutes there is a child in Yemen that is dying because of malnourishment? And whatever else you think of the political situation in Yemen, I mean, you could blame, put some blame on the Houthis, you could, there's definitely some involvement of Iran. We know that the cause right now of the malnourishment and the potential famine, which is 14 million people, by the way, potentially having a famine, to put that in context, the world's worst famine in West Bengal was 3 million, and Rwanda was 800,000 in terms of the total death. We know it's being caused because of the bombing of the port of Hodeida. And we should stop, insist on the stop, stopping that bombing and allowing food and medicine to get in. And then you can have a political solution with whatever the political arguments are. So Mattis and Pompeo, I give them some credit for recognizing that the refueling needs to stop, but their statement left a lot of loopholes. They said, well, first the Houthis need to act. And uh, then we will require the Saudis to engage in a ceasefire. Now, I'm not even, I don't even want to argue with them about whether the Houthis or the Saudis are more to blame. I mean, I have my own view that the Saudis are more to blame. But even if you believe that the Houthis are more to blame, the point is, we know who's bombing the port of Hodeida right now. Stop that bombing, get food and medicine in, and then argue about the politics. So, unfortunately, we didn't get a vote yesterday. 
we're going to continue to, to push for this, but the change uh, that Khashoggi has uh, triggered hasn't been as much as I would have thought. Uh, Chris, do you want to wait for the microphone? Uh, Hi, thank you. Christopher Preble from the Cato Institute. Thanks to you both for your leadership on this issue. A uh, question about a related bill. Uh, Ted Lieu has uh, offered up legislation to limit the president's ability to initiate uh, first use of nuclear weapons. Do either of you wish to comment on that? I can comment, but if you want to... Go ahead, you start. I'll, I'll... I, I support the bill. I mean, there are other countries that have uh, that policy and that, uh, that has kept uh, them... Uh, perfectly safe. And the policy, by the way, provides an exemption, if you read Ted Lieu's bill, if there was a concern about an imminent attack. So it's not something that is uh, going to uh, tie the president's hands in, in the case of some uh, emergency. What it's saying is, as a matter of policy, uh, the United States doesn't believe we preemptively should be using uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, these are policies that I think will uh, help create a safer world. Now, ultimately, in, in my view, the biggest beneficiary of a safe, stable world is the United States, because we happen to have one of the best economies and best standards of living. We, we, we are the most at risk when there's instability in the world. And so uh, I think a, first, a no first use policy would help uh, bring a greater stability. Yes, comment. That's been the policy of the Declare War Clause for 228 years. Uh, that is, the president, whether he initiates war with nuclear weapons or anything else, he can't do that unless Congress authorizes it. Unless, as uh, Roe pointed out, uh, and this is understood by the framers, you know, it's in order to respond to a sudden or imminent attack on the United States. Then he can use nuclear weapons or anything else in self-defense. But other than that, it's astonishing. It's it's like, in my mind, a, a statute that says there shall be no violation of free speech or press. No, it's in the First Amendment. Why you have a statute that implements what's been around in common knowledge for 200 and some years. But anyway, it's, I think the fact that there's a bill there exemplifies how far our understanding of, of the war power is. Uh, this gentleman here, here. You have, oh, Kelly, you have the mic. Fred Bonick from the Daily Ripple, and first I'd like to thank uh, thank you, Representative Buck, for uh, for raising a warrior, and and thank you for your son's service. Uh, <clears throat> I happen to be a gold star dad and have three other kids serving. So um, my question is, uh, and I know you weren't um, you weren't involved, in, you weren't a congressman during the uh, the beginning of the Syria um, war, where they were going to do with the red line came up. But a quick a quick note. Um, the longest time period since 9-11 was 122 day, 21 days since without a casualty. The second longest was uh, 116 days, and they both happened in 2015-2016. We're on day 13 right now, and more soldiers have been killed in the last in, under this administration than the last two years of the previous. My question is, um, every, it seems as your side of the aisle has a real problem, and they kept bringing up this red line and how Obama didn't do it, but he actually did what you were, you're asking for. He asked Congress to vote on it. Um, why is it now such a problem uh, to get someone to do what you're asking is have a uh, War Powers Act? It's been since at least that point that topic's been up. What's the problem? What's the problem? Yeah, because it was your side that was complaining uh, about it then. Well, um, uh, the leadership in the Republican Party would deny that I'm on their side. Um, <laughs> most of the time. Um, I think that the, uh, the problem is that uh, the Republicans uh, for the last four years that I've been in Congress were too concerned about keeping the majority um, and avoiding uh, tough votes. And the result is that the American people decided uh, to give the majority to the other side um, in, in the hopes that the other side will make tough votes and will take tough votes. Um, I think the, the key uh, in Congress is that we have the debate. Um, even more important than how the debate ends or how the vote ends 
is that we raise the issues and, and we tackle uh, the tough issues. Whether we actually come to a resolution or not is less important to me than the fact that we assert our authority and, and go through the process. And so um, I would have liked to have seen this uh, issue on Yemen resolved. Uh, I, I understand the argument from Republican leadership that uh, there, the, there has not been, or it, it would not have been ripe um, until after Thanksgiving anyway, and there would not be a, a thorough debate on it. Um, so kick it off until the next Congress. I actually have more faith that the Democrats will raise this issue in the House next Congress and, and force a debate on uh, war powers than, than the Republicans. But uh, whether, it, whether it's, you know, I'm a fiscal conservative. I'm there because the deficit horrifies me. Uh, the national debt horrifies me. Um, we're unable as uh, conservatives to get any vote, any meaningful vote, on uh, trying to reduce our, our national debt or, or, or reduce the deficit. And so uh, I, I have no faith that Congress will um, move in a direction that uh, puts members at risk until the, the American public forces us to, to act. I, I did vote for the tax cuts, absolutely. And, and that's, a, that's a whole other panel. Happy to have that conversation with you. I think that's a much more difficult conversation than just uh, it created some sort of uh, uh, debt. But. This gentleman back here, yeah, next to Mr. Pribble. Hi. Um, the question uh, is this is, um, I guess, sort of maybe the elephant in the room, or both nationally and internationally, would be the, the scourge of drugs. And in terms of our, our, both our allies and enemies, frenemies, however you would call it, and with, with few exceptions, uh, the, um, their, it appears that certainly in the West, uh, probably the major societal problem is drugs, legal or illegal or otherwise. Uh, so m my question is this, is uh, for either of these gentlemen, uh, what do you think the incoming Congress should do concerning in terms of assisting both, uh, assisting our allies and taking care of domestically about basically this major societal problem, which is, you know, causing a breakdown of everything ranging from the American family to traditional families to just people, period, all over the world. I, I agree with you that the drugs, and particularly the opioid crisis, has been uh, hurting and ravaging communities across this country in many, many of our states. I don't think that was an external problem, it was an internal problem. Uh, you know, Lincoln, I think, famously said, what's going to hurt America is not an external threat, it's an uh, internal crisis. And that problem, in part, was caused by the greed of pharmaceutical companies that were uh, marketing drugs and pushing these drugs without uh, telling doctors the consequences of them. And it led to a crisis of the overprescription uh, of opiates uh, without uh, understanding uh, all of the harm that they were going to do. Now we're in a situation where we have to try a comprehensive approach in terms of not just reining in the pharmaceuticals, but uh, uh, investing in treatment and investing in uh, economic opportunities for folks who uh, suffer from these addictions, making sure there are enough beds and hospitals to, to treat people. Uh, but I. Uh, and also, I, I think, moving away from the war on drugs, which uh, has given people at, at young ages uh, convictions and arrest records uh, that is making it harder for them to get education or be productive members of society. So I agree with you that drugs are a huge challenge for the country, but I, I view that as more an internal issue uh, than uh, an issue of an external threat. We finally have a good issue that a progressive and a conservative can disagree on, and I appreciate you raising the issue. Um, I have uh, a lot of experience with drugs, not firsthand, but as a prosecutor. I want to make sure everybody on the cameras understands I'm not 
a user, but rather a prosecutor. Um, but I, I do think it is a foreign policy issue as well as a domestic uh, issue. And I, I think that uh, we make a serious mistake when we try to uh, separate our uh, foreign policy interests from our trade interests and from our domestic interests like uh, uh, narcotics use in this country. We don't grow uh, uh, heroin uh, uh, in this country or cocaine. Uh, it is imported. <laughs> And it's often imported across our southern border, and it's often imported with uh, illegal immigrants. And if we don't deal with our immigration issue and we don't deal with our border security issue, we're going to continue to see uh, that kind of problem expand. And so we need to put pressure on Mexico. We need to put pressure on other countries um, to, uh, to help us with a very serious problem. But it's a domestic issue. The, the demand uh, will be met. Um, if we don't start dealing with the demand side of the equation. And we deal with the demand side of the equation by putting people in prison for a long time and building more prison cells and making sure there is a consequence in this country for violating the rule of law. And, and so I, I think it is both a domestic and, and foreign policy issue. This an observation. Just, uh, just clarify, I, I certainly agree that we shouldn't be allowing uh, drugs into the country and that we need to have uh, a, a tough uh, enforcement on uh, making sure drugs aren't coming. But if you look at, in my view, one of the misallocations of resources under this administration, they put more resources going after uh, mothers with young kids coming across the border and less of our ICE agents and uh, enforcement on drug trafficking uh, and human trafficking. And it has been a total misallocation of resources that have actually made us more vulnerable to drugs coming in because they've been obsessed about uh, making sure that kids with, uh, with mothers aren't, aren't coming in. And if you talk to the ICE agents, they will tell you that there's been a, a total misallocation of resources that has actually made us more vulnerable to drugs coming in. So I would uh, go back to a policy that is prioritizing uh, uh, drug trafficking and not uh, uh, kid, uh, young uh, parents uh, and kids and criminalizing that behavior. This is just too good to pass up. I'm sorry, Bruce, but um, if you want to deal with this uh, issue, um, uh, and I have talked to ICE agents who will tell you that sanctuary cities in this country are uh, a huge part of the problem. In Denver, an ICE agent cannot go into the jail to deport a heroin dealer um, who has been caught by the Denver police because the Denver City Council has decided uh, to make that uh, jail off limits to any federal agency and the Denver police officers can be prosecuted criminally for passing information along to uh, federal agents. So again, immigration is related to domestic policy and, and foreign policy. Um, and, and we are making a, a terrible mistake when we, uh, when we give sanctuary to drug dealers in, in this country. Yeah, well, that does have a, an international war dimension too since our invasion of Afghanistan, opium production has uh, reached a pinnacle there uh, to fund uh, or underwrite the drug traffic into the United States. But uh, Danny Davis, oh, sorry. You're next, Danny, after just introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, um, Nick, I'm a graduate student here in DC. Um, and we touched upon you know, the shadow wars that the US is fighting, 17 conflicts. Um, and I'm interested in you know, this revolves around Title 50 and Title 10, where Title 50 is CIA covert paramilitary operations, and Title 10 revolves around the special operators, the DOD. Um, and Title 50 is subjected to a presidential finding and then immediately alerting the congressional committees. Do you believe that Title 10 should be subjected to the same standards um, to produce oversight for a better understanding of congressmen to know these shadow wars that are being fought and for the public to understand it? I appreciate the question. I think some of the reforms that you talked about in terms of presidential oversight requirement came out of the Church Committee in a, a sense that we couldn't just have uh, agencies uh, engaged in the overthrow of governments or assassinations without uh, the understanding and approval explicitly uh, of the president. One of the things that's concerning to me, and, and I uh, don't have firsthand knowledge of this, but I've heard some of the co my colleagues talk about this, uh, is undoing uh, some of the uh, church committee's recommendations where you have people talking about uh, not requiring the president to have to sign off on some of these agencies actions and I would strongly oppose any uh, such effort in an intelligence authorization bill uh, 
uh, we need to make sure that the president has uh, that authority. And I would support, frankly, uh, at least in classified settings, uh, having Congress be briefed and having uh, congressional oversight uh, over, over that. Uh, the history of overthrows uh, has not made the United States safer. I mean, that caused the whole crisis with Iran was because of the overthrow of Mossadegh. And whatever else you think of Mossadegh, what he was doing, I mean, what prompted that, he was nationalizing Iranian oil uh, as a move against uh, colonialism because it was a basic British colony and Mossadegh said, no, I want to nationalize Iran's oil. I don't want British to have uh, those profits. I can't, I don't understand if there's, how that has made the United States any more secure, any more prosperous in the 21st century. So uh, I, I, I do think uh, uh, having some form of congressional oversight is, is critical. Agree. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Danny Davis from Defense Priorities. Uh, I got a question on, from the congressional side, both, both sides uh, of the aisle. Whether it's the, the Yemen vote that didn't happen yesterday or, or any of these other 17 wars or combat actions that uh, haven't ever gotten any congressional action or anything actually all the way through since 9-11. You've mentioned a couple of the reasons why Congress is unwilling to take a vote or unwilling to take a stand on that kind of thing. <clears throat> uh, and I know for sure that there are many members on, on both sides in both chambers that would be happy to do what you said because I've talked to a number of them, but it's the leadership seems to be in both parties, in both chambers, and it doesn't matter which one is in power at the time. They seem to be on the same track. So the question I have is based on maybe other things that you've seen over the years, what would provide the impetus to change the dynamics so that Congress would find it in their interest to do so? I mean, whether is it a letter writing campaign? Is it people protesting? Is it something else? What could change the dynamic so that they could actually have the ability to, to take these votes? And if I could just add, why don't you change the rules for leadership? When you elect leadership, whether it's Pelosi or whether it's a successor to Ryan, just say, we're not going to vote for you to leader unless you let us vote on war and peace. Put that into the rules. Why don't you do that? You have the, you have the numbers. Well, uh, a couple, couple points. One, I, even though Congressman Bucket, I disagree on certain issues, I, I do think we need more people with his courage. I mean, when you have someone who has a background as a prosecutor, district attorney, uh, has credibility in not being seen as soft on, on crime or soft on matters, matters of national security and is willing to speak out against his own leadership, which is not easy in Congress because the leadership determines your committees. The leadership determines whether your bill can get a vote. The leadership determines uh, a, a lot of uh, whether you can be effective. It's not just careerism that uh, may want you to be uh, in uh, the good graces of leadership. If you want to be effective, you have to be uh, a part of uh, building with, with leadership. And so uh, I do think uh, we need more people in both parties uh, with that kind of courage that saying on matters of war and peace, we have a constitutional duty before uh, an obligation uh, to party. In terms of what can be done, I, I think the American conservative and, and conservatives around this country can have a huge role. Uh, I mean, I see, uh, of course, there are progressives and there are human rights uh, concerns and the mobilization. But if uh, there was mobilization around this country, as there was during uh, Ron Paul's campaign and, and, to, and, and, and other campaigns, saying uh, it's in our national interest not to be engaged in military interventionism, and that uh, you can run for Congress, you can run for the Senate, you can run for the presidency and be seen as strong on national security while advocating military restraint, uh, I think that would go a, a long way. Uh, you know, I remember I was talking to Senator Rand Paul and he said, I don't understand why more people on your, on your side aren't running uh, anti-war campaigns. There's actually the, the, the American public is hungry for uh, leadership that is going to stop these foreign interventions. And so I think if that becomes a real voting issue, uh, and if we have both conservatives and progressives speaking out about it, uh, it will make a difference. Ken, you want to have the last word? We're about done with time. I will, I will make it very short. First, thank you for your kind words. I'm not sure if it's courage or lack of intelligence, um, but <laughs> I, I do think that the, the key is to elect members of Congress who don't want to be here. And, and if we had more people running for Congress uh, on, on both sides of the Hill uh, that, that truly uh, saw this as a short-term 
uh, job and not a, a long-term career, uh, we would be better off because the, uh, and I think you're absolutely right with the factors, you, you will, uh, if you don't vote for the uh, uh, designee of your party for speaker, you will lose your committee assignments, you will not uh, receive fundraising help, you will uh, uh, have a short uh, uh, time uh, on the Hill which is really what I think most of us uh, that, that uh, stand strong on these issues want is a short time. We, we want to get out of the swamp as, as fast as we can. So thank you very much for the American Conservative for, for holding this. I appreciate well, it. Thank you, Congressman Connick, Congressman Buck, and we'll surrender to our successor. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, we'll take a five-minute coffee break and resume with our uh, keynote address from Senator Rand Paul. Thank you.